Fellows represent a broad range of career stages and diverse disciplinary backgrounds and serve in year-long assignments in the executive, judicial, or legislative branches of the federal government in Washington, D.C. The fellowship program features seven different program areas and applicants can apply to up to two program areas. You can learn more about each program area, including potential host offices, by clicking the Become a Fellow link on the fellowship's website. Fellowship requirements include holding U.S. citizenship and a doctoral degree in science or engineering. Applicants with a master's in engineering and three years of professional engineering experience are also eligible to apply. To learn more about the eligibility and application process, please visit the fellowship's website. So now what we'd like to do is open the session up to your questions. This is your chance to ask questions, learn more about your fellowships, and determine learn more about the fellowships and determine if it's a good fit. And again, as a reminder, type your questions into the Ask a Question box on the bottom right of your screen, and then click Send. And to begin, I'd like to start off with a few questions for Carrie. Carrie, your career has taken you from emergency and critical care medicine to consulting and professional and organizational leadership and development. So at this point in your career, what prompted you to apply to the fellowships? Uh, first of all, just I just want to make a disclaimer, it's hard to look at the camera and listen to you at the same time. So if I'm looking like I have shifty eyes, that's that's why. Um, I think at this point in my career, I have increasingly done more and more with um, a policy, but programs as well, that were expanding beyond the local and regional area to international work. And what I was finding was there was a real disconnect. Are you getting that feedback? Yeah, there's a little bit of feedback. Sorry about that. No, um, I don't think, is that me? I don't think so. Um, is that better? Yeah, it's much better now. Okay. So uh, anyway, what I was finding was there was a, a, a big disconnect between things that were happening, sort of practically speaking, in the sciences and in the field work, with, especially with what I was doing internationally with regard to animal welfare. And I wanted to understand more about that. Uh, <laughs> primarily with the idea that I wanted to continue to do work but have the same amount of energy have a much greater positive impact for society both domestically and globally. So DC is where that happens and this fellowship is a great opportunity to, to do what I wanted to do to expand what I was doing. Great. Can you talk a little bit about your experience um, as a congressional fellow and maybe talk about what an average day, or maybe not so average day, is like for a congressional fellow. Because I know every day is very different and very unique. So I've been very grateful for my background in emergency and critical care. It's coming very handy. So there's not really necessarily a typical day. We're in recess, for instance, right now. So it's relatively quiet in the office. We're catching up on bills that we may be writing or background for letters to constituents. I'm doing research. Um, during my congressman is on state and foreign operations appropriations subcommittee uh, and, and a couple of others, but that's the one I'm most involved with. So when the bills are being written and when they're going through what they call markup, when they're actually looking at the bills and having people from various members of the committees decide what they want to include and what they don't want to include, then it gets pretty exciting and we're very busy and, and sometimes some long hours. The, fellow, the nice thing about the fellowship, too, and my congressional office, I, I know this isn't the case for all of them, but my congressional office has been very, very good about encouraging me to go wherever I need to go and do whatever I need to do to accomplish the work of the office. And I've been working very heavily on Ebola. So that's taken me to the UN, to New York. Um, I've been doing some work with some universities. So I think that's maybe not the most usual experience, but I think it depends on the office. The other thing I think it's important for people to consider if they're considering the Congressional Fellowship is that the, um, there's Nita, hi. Yeah, there we go. We've got Nita back, so, okay. Well, please continue, Carrie. So, um, there's, there are, you, you have a choice of being in a Congressional, in a, in a Congressional office, but you can be in the House of Representatives or in the Senate. And, it's very common that people pick the Senate, which is interesting because in the House of Representatives, if you have 
I think a lot more that you can do, uh, sort of broadly speaking and depth-wise as well, but you have a lot more contact with the member and the entire range of the staff. So the experiences between Senate and House offices can be quite different. Um, and I think that, you know, considering your politics is somewhat important, but it's not necessarily a defining thing. It's what your talents are that you bring and what the office needs and how that will work together to move thoughtful policy forward using your background as a scientist. Great, thank you. Okay, great. Now that we've got Nita um, just joined us, so Nita, a question for you. So you were a practicing physician for seven years, so what made you decide to apply to the fellowships at this point in your career? Uh, well, for several reasons. I mean, in clinical practice, many of the things that we do are influenced by federal policy, and in clinical practice, you're often disconnected from why those decisions are made and, uh, you know, the pipeline to getting to that point that affects patient care and clinical practice. So I really wanted exposure to different facets of the federal government that actually have an impact on health services and patient outcomes and clinical practice. Great. So you're an executive branch fellow at the NSF, could, so could you maybe describe what an average day um, is like um, as an executive branch fellow? Sure, I think my favorite part is that there really is no average day. Right. Um, every day is different, which I absolutely love. Um, so some of the days uh, involve working on my current projects, um, which are NSF specific uh, to the Smart and Connected Health Program which is a program looking at how to leverage computer science, engineering, social, behavioral, and economic science to transform healthcare. So there are specific projects that I work on for that, but I also get the luxury of going to various meetings all over DC that are relevant in the health technology sphere. Um, the other aspect of my days are doing my own research on uh, health information technology and ways to leverage health technology for patient outcomes. Great. Okay, so at this point we'll go ahead and turn it over to some of the questions that have been coming in. So we received an advanced question and a question that just came in. And Carrie, I think it's uh, this question is for you. So the question the person is asking is, do you have any recommendations for how to stand out for congressional placement? Um, and then somebody else asked a similar question is, how do they succeed uh, to be an applicant for the congressional fellowship and how should they prepare to be um, for the semifinalist interview? So I should probably clarify what's meant by semifinalist interview. And, and so I was sponsored by my professional organization, the American Veterinary Medical Association, and they had a prescribed way that they that they ran their selection process. We were asked to, we were given a mock policy issue and asked to write a policy brief basically explaining for a mock congressperson uh, what our recommendations would be on this particular issue and, and using our science background to to uh, examine that. So that was what I did. And then after that process, we had an interview, uh, in-person interview. So I think, and, and actually, I'll be really honest with you, I Googled policy brief, and I found a great policy brief and used that as a model. So I didn't have to call a friend, although you could probably do that. Um, so there's actually some great resources online, and I'm happy to serve as a resource for anybody that, that might need some help with that. You guys can just let me know. Great, thank you. And also, I just wanted to um, clarify, so AAAS sponsors two congressional fellows each year, and we also have 31 partner societies that sponsor primarily congressional fellows. If you apply through one of our partner societies, as Curie has done, the application eligibility process, the selection criteria, is all managed directly by the partner society. So your application date may differ from the AAAS application deadline, which is November 1st. And the, uh, the selection, selection criteria may also differ from the way the AAAS selection criteria works. So I just wanted to kind of clarify that. So a, a question related to that came in is related to sort of what the pace is like as an SNT policy fellow versus um, working in academia, perhaps working in um, on a postdoc. So questions to both Nita and Carrie: How did you adjust to the change? Adjust to this change of pace? And how often are you asked to advise on topics where you have little background knowledge? So, Nita, do you want to? Yeah, sure. Um, 
So I come from the perspective of what my life was in clinical medicine to what my daily activities are here as a fellow. And I would say that the biggest difference is the amount of flexibility you have and how much, there's, how much support there is really for your own professional development and crafting your days so that you get the most uh, insights into what your professional interests are, um, which is very different than clinical medicine where you have a schedule, you stick to that schedule, it's quite rigorous and it's for direct patient care, which is wonderful, but it definitely doesn't have the same level of flexibility that um, the fellowship days do. Um, and in terms of uh, giving uh, guidance outside of the realm of my expertise, um, you know, I really haven't had to do that very much. I mean, I've I've been relied upon for my expertise, but I feel like the other part of it is that I've had a very huge learning curve, almost a linear vertical learning curve here at the National Science Foundation to learn how my background fits into this um, this branch, this uh, office of the executive branch. So that part has also been really interesting and exciting. Wait, Carrie, do you want to um, answer that question as well? Can you clarify the question again? It was about what oh, making the transitions. Yes. Um, so I I had so I have sort of an odd background. I'm I'm one of the older fellows and have a lot of background outside of clinical medicine, in um, program development, organizational, a lot of organizational leadership and professional and biomedical organizations, um, program management on international programs with the government. So what I would say for me it was just another pretty challenging thing. The steepest learning curve for me has been understanding policy. Policy making is very, very complex and lots of rules and lots of rules that have rules that change all the time. So I think just to go in with it, knowing that probably if you're doing a congressional, congressional fellowship, probably about the end of your fellowship is when you'll start feeling relatively comfortable with the process because really the only way to understand it is to go through it. And so, um, and some of the guidance that was given in my office was there is no guidance. This is, you just, as the process unfolds, you'll kind of watch it unfold. So that was good advice for me. Um, and then the pace for me, I, I had a very, very busy pace before coming here and has stayed the same with the exception of I'm far more sedentary very physically active in all the work I did before. In the congressional office, there's a lot of sitting and a lot of typing. So you want to you want to work in your self care and getting out, and moving around if you're going to be in a congressional office. Great. And just as a reminder, this is your chance to ask questions. Kiri and Nita are here to answer any questions that you might have about the fellowship experience, the application process, and you can submit your questions by typing into the Q and A screen. At the, bottom, at the bottom right hand of your screen, screen and then clicking the speech um, bubble. So another question that's coming in, I think it's uh, a little bit, is asking for a little bit of clarification. So the AAAS policy fellowships are open to um, individuals who hold doctoral degrees in the STEM field. So that includes um, PhDs um, within STEM as well as MDs like um, Nia and so in the health medical fields as well as the veterinarians like Harry. So, so it's pretty broad in terms of the follows that are the diverse career stages and the disciplines that are represented within the fellowship program. So because the focus of this, um, this chat session is kind of hearing a little bit more about how fellows with a background in health policy are um, contributing to the federal policy arena here in Washington, D.C. Can you both speak a little bit about sort of what you feel is the impact that you're making in health policy and what you feel that like your contribu contribution is to the political decision-making process? So, Kira, you go ahead. Oh, okay, Nia, do you want to start that one? Uh, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so, again, to talk a little bit about what my program is, it's really... Um, for cutting edge research in a computer science, engineering, um, information science, and social, behavioral, and economic sciences um, that are designed to transform healthcare. Um, I think the role that I have been able to contribute is to really talk about how to engage um, the health side as collaborators with all of this innovation. Because oftentimes when you're on the clinical side, you're uh, at the end of the pipeline. You're not part of the pipeline process of all of these new technologies coming out that really impact patient care. So being able to be an advocate for uh, collaboration with other health 
um, health researchers has been a huge part. The other part has been with our review process and really looking at what our portfolio looks like in terms of funded research and how it aligns with federal initiatives for health priorities has been another way that I've contributed um, because that is very much my world is thinking about uh, national health priorities and how, um, how to craft practice management for that. But this is more looking at how can we infuse research dealing with technology so it also reflects what federal initiatives are. Great. And Carrie, I know you've done a lot of work recently um, on health policy and specifically with the Ebola crisis. Could, could you speak to a little bit about that? Sure. So just as a little background, the portfolios I've been um, working on are primarily related to international development for hunger and poverty alleviation, so food and nutrition security. Um, and then also some pieces of the global health portfolio, but very specifically related to Ebola. I worked in Liberia. I've got background in teaching biosecurity and understand a lot about emerging diseases. I've also been working on wildlife conservation. That's a priority of the congressman. And I was told when I started the fellowship, you know, don't really expect in a congressional fellowship that you're actually going to see some positive impact from the work that you've done perhaps ever, but perhaps not for 10 or 15 years. And I've been very, very fortunate that that has, that has not been the case for me. I have been able to work with a lot of um, people that do advocacy on Capitol Hill that help inform us about what's going on, apply science to that, and then I'm able to, um, sorry, my screen just went blank. Um, and then, so my congressman is, again, an appropriator. They're the people that, that give money. So there's authorizers that say, yes, you can have that program. And there's appropriators that say, and here's the money to do that program or not, if they don't like your program. So we were able to get some seminal changes in that allows organizations to have, uh, that do international development work for hunger and poverty to have much greater impact for the poorest people with with fewer dollars, so serve more people, less money. And this is something that somebody had been working on trying to get in place for six years, and we were able to accomplish that through through my work in the office. Uh, we've had some good outcomes on wildlife trafficking. Um, and the work on Ebola has been interesting in that we are now starting to move the conversation more towards a paradigm where we're actually building capacity and resilience and sustainable programs, which has been spoken about a lot, but it's not actually being done in most of the federal agencies. So we've been able to move that conversation. Um, and I've actually been able to do some of this work with some folks that are, that are working with the UN and at the UN. And that conversation is ongoing. And Ebola has been the place where that has been coming together. So tremendous progress in the last several months on that, largely because the fellowship places you in a position where you can meet people that also care, and you've got the sort of imprimatur of the office behind you to say, look, I have somebody that's interested in this. What can we do to make this better? Great. Thank you. So there's a question related to, I think it's, this is directly um, asking about the Congressional Fellowship experience, but Nina, I think you could also um, address this as well, too. So the question is, I've heard it's important for prospective Congressional Fellows to be conversant on current policy topics before interviewing for and entering the fellowships. So did you find this to be the case? And if so, were there any tools that you used to get up to speed on relevant policy? Um, so Kira, if you wanted to answer that, but Nina, I'd also like to hear sort of your thoughts on what you did to, in terms of when you were thinking about applying to the fellowship and as you were drafting your application to sort of get up to speed on um, policy. So, Kerry? Sure. So, I think the thing to remember about the congressional fellowships is you have no idea what you're going to be working on until you get into the office. Um, or until you start the interview process, might be. Now, I'm a veterinarian. They're not going to be likely to hire me to do client, uh, climate policy work, but that can happen. And so you have to be prepared to just remember that it's your background as a scientist, your ability to ask questions, your ability to think critically and in complex ways that is the real benefit. And the beauty of the fellowship is that through the professional development, you gain skills in how to communicate that simply. So, for instance, I was asked to, when I'm giving backgrounders for, for different people, different legislators, um, 
Tell me about Ebola in three to five bullet points. Tell me about wildlife trafficking in three to five bullet points. Lots of per persuasive um, communications. So I didn't have to do a lot of preparation because I had done a lot already. However, um, just that ability to, to apply the ideas of science to what you're doing because there are very few scientists on Capitol Hill and they just, people just don't think that way. So just bringing your mind and what you care about with you will be enough. Great. And then, Nina, do you want to talk about sort of what you did in preparation for applying to the fellowships and when you were putting your application together? Sure. Um, I knew that I wanted to work in health technology. And so I really did my research by going through and looking at all the different federal initiatives that involve uh, health information technology. So that was with um, different branches of the executive branch and different agencies. So I looked at NIH, I looked at NSF, I looked at the ONC, and really looked at all of their priorities um, in terms of policy and in terms of health technology to give myself some background. Um, and how I would fit in to those different agencies. Great. All right. So we, uh, there's also a question that came in about professional development, and I know, Carrie, that you spoke about this a little bit too, so I just wanted to provide some background. So not, you receive professional development not only through your fellowship placement and your, the work that you do for your host office, but also through the policy fellowship program. So your fellowship year begins with an intensive two-week orientation where you hear from thought leaders and experts within the policy realm. It's a great way to get your feet wet, get some um, hear from the experts within, within the policy field. And then when you go off to your host agencies, throughout your fellowship year, you also receive professional development workshops. So we, um, AAAS offers about one or two workshops each month, and we have three main um, tracks for our professional development workshops, and those tracks include policy, leadership, and communication. And that's also a great way, as Kiri had mentioned, to learn more about how policy works, interact with different experts within the policy realm, and also it's a great way to engage with your class of fellows as well, and to be able to kind of tap into their um, expertise that they bring to the fellowship uh, as a means of helping you within the work that you do with your host office. And Carrie, I mean, I don't know if you've been involved. I know Carrie, especially, I know with congressional fellowships, it's um, sometimes a little bit more difficult. But Carrie, have you had any experience working with some of the um, affinity groups? And if you wanted to speak a little bit about that. I mean, sorry, yeah. Nina, if you wanted to speak a little bit about your work um, um, with some of the affinity groups? Um, sure. I mean, I will first start back to your point about um, the first presentation. I did find several of those uh, lectures and training sessions very, very useful. Um, one of my favorites was the um, uh, government writing exercise um, because it is very different from scientific writing. And I think I gained a lot from that exercise in terms of writing about things objectively and for a wider audience. And I have actually used those skills as I've written some pieces here at NSF for a wide audience, including scientists and congressional audiences, so it's been it's been a very good exercise. In terms of affinity groups, um, one of the ones that I have been involved in at the beginning was the broader impacts group, thinking of ways to, which is one of the missions of the NSF, um, is uh, to have a broader impacts component. And so that was a, a one that I was involved in early on. Great. And, and that's just to uh, help you. Sorry. So affinity groups are special interest topical groups that are run and managed by the fellows. So we have a broad range of affinity groups focusing on science communication, big data, global health. Um, one recently launched um, affinity group is also focusing on STEM and art and the connection between the two. And it's a great way, again, to allow you to focus on air, with, uh, your own particular area of expertise and network with guest speakers as well as network with the current class of fellows as well as alumni fellows who also participate in affinity group activities from time to time. So another question that's come in is, is asking is what do you both hope will be the next phase in your um, career and how what's the um, connection do you feel the fellowship experience to the next um, step within your um, career path? Who would you like to take that first? Oh. Nita, um, do you want to take that one? Oh, sure. Um, 
So next year, I like to say that I'm going to have a new job and an old job, um, which is super fun. Um, the new job is that I will be director of evidence-based practice um, for a large network of community health centers using large data sets um, for research on patient outcomes, but also on researching on the translational side of, of research. Um, and my old job is that I'll continue to do clinical work, which I obviously really love. Um, the fellowship has been a tremendous opportunity because I really did get what I hoped to, which is to understand what the different stakeholders do and how they impact policy related to health information technology. So that was huge. The other component was being here at the National Science Foundation and being around so many basic scientists in computer science and engineering and hearing of the work that they're doing in health information technology and the potential for working with large data sets, large health related data sets. Um, so without that experience, I don't think I would have been able to adopt my new job um, because it's given me a tremendous amount of background information in how those things are interrelated. Great. Karen? So what's next? That's a great question. Sometimes when you're doing a congressional fellowship, it may be the same for Nita. It's really busy and, and difficult to necessarily plan ahead. So remember that if you do the congressional fellowship, because we kind of go sliding into the home base right at the right at the end. At this point, my intention is to go back to my um, consulting business. I would like to do a little clinical practice again. I don't know if that's going to happen. But I'm pretty much going to be staying in the international global health emerging disease arena, probably around what they call One Health, so that intersection of human, animal, and environmental health. I'm an advisor for Veterinary International Development NGO. And so that place where there are gaps in currently what we're doing to continue to work on the policy and the programs to, to improve what's happening with global health. Great. So Nia, we have a question that came in for you. So the question is asking, and you mentioned that you have flexibility in your um, position to do your own research. But can you clarify that? Are you pursuing your own research in addition to what you're doing as a policy fellow, and are these things related? So sure, actually it's very related to the work I'm doing in Smart and Connected Health. Um, my research interests are looking at how mobile health um, can be used to improve health disparities. And so having access to some of the leaders in the field of mobile health here through Smart and Connected Health was incredibly valuable. So my research was in that area. Um, it's not clinical research, um, so that's a little bit different because I would have to be back at my home base to do that. Um, but it's researching areas in mobile health and how they impact um, both disparities and other topics such as aging in place, though, those areas of research. Um, I hope that answers the question. If not, I'm happy to speak in more detail. Okay, great. And just to clarify that the fellowship experience is where you're working on policy initiatives for your host office or for your um, congressional office, so you aren't pursuing your own research. You may be able to ask uh, Nita is, is um, working on issues that's relating to her research interests, but you aren't working on your particular research area. So this is more of a public service and a professional development experience, and it's very different and is not a postdoctoral um, experience where you would be working on one, one particular research um, area. So one of the questions that we um, received sort of in advance was people were wondering is, what do you wish more applicants knew about the policy fellowships before they applied? So kind of looking back, what do you wish you knew uh, before you apply to the program. Curie, do you want to take that one first? Sure. So for those of you that are doing the Congressional Fellowship, um, the, the placement process can, can be pretty rigorous from the standpoint of, of uh, how do I say this? It can, it can really kind of shake your self-confidence. I think a lot of people through that process, because the Congressional offices and, and committees and subcommittees advertise that they want someone, but everybody in the fellowship class, and I, I can't remember, I think there are 33 in our class, you're all working with the same office, so you're sending out resumes, you're, you're doing interviews, so that's a, if, I think if you talk to congressional fellows, they're going to tell you that's a pretty stressful time, so just realize, if you do the fellowship, it's really not that big a deal. The main thing was everybody sat in a room that AAAS provided and worked, you have to reduce your, your CV to one page, 
I've done this a long time. Reducing my CV to one page was kind of stressful, but there were other fellows who sat with me, um, and we worked on that too, and we all shared and edited each other's work and did that together. So the first few weeks are pretty stressful, and I've heard this from many, many alumni fellows that have done the congressional fellowships. You'll get through it, it ends up being really, really fun, and you make friends for life who support you even though they're not in the same office that you're in. It's a, it's a remarkable experience. Great. Nita? Sure. Uh, I think uh, what I wish I would have known is that you know, different agencies have very, very different cultures. And to really come into the process being very open-minded, um, I think when people do come for an interview week, they get a sense of that. Uh, but I think uh, trying to talk to people at those agencies to find out what the culture is 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 great uh, is a great idea. Um, it turns out that the culture aligns very well here at NSF with what I hope to get out of this. But I do think that is something to look into and speak to to alum fellows to find out what the culture of their agencies are. Okay. And then we have another question sort of related to the application um, process. What would you both um, sort of describe as maybe the key experiences? that would help someone succeed when they're applying to a AAAS policy fellowship. So obviously beyond demonstrating strong science and technology credentials, what would you also recommend to someone so that they have a more competitive application? Curie, do you want to answer that first? Um, well, I probably can only speak to my application. Um, you know, I think the main thing is to really be true to yourself and try to reflect as best you can who you are, what you care about, what your expertise and experience is. But what you don't want to try to do is shape it for something that you think somebody might want because it's not going to be a good fit and you're not going to end up probably being very happy. So most people that are applying for this, um, I'm getting, sorry, my screen went back again. Um, I think most of the folks that I've known that have applied for this have cared passionately about exploring other avenues for their own professional development in, in ways that are really going to stretch them and teach them a lot. Also where they can contribute, it gives them a chance to bring what they uniquely have to bear on some really important processes. So the main thing is really try to paint it, the, make your application to be the job that you imagine you would like to have. And then Nita? Yeah, I think I'm just thinking back to the things that uh, you know interviewers and other people seem to find interesting about my application as well. Um, so I think a lot of people expressed interest in the past work I had done that was in the realm of public service. So a lot of my volunteer work or research that I had done that was for the greater good and not just for my own scientific curiosity. So I think that is definitely something to um, perhaps emphasize, especially if it is something that you were passionate about, and hopefully you were and loved it. Um, but I definitely think people were very interested in those aspects of my application. Um, because I think at some level, anyone who does this and anyone who has pursued a doctoral degree has some level of intellectual curiosity and, um, and uh, scientific accomplishments. But also what could make you stand apart from the pack is how your work has contributed to, to social service or public service. And if I could, I would, I would absolutely agree. That is probably the reason that I got the fellowship, because I've got 32 years of doing that. And, um, and it was very background. And it's really, really important. Right. And Nina, maybe could you speak a little bit about sort of the um, beyond sort of when you drafted your application, but actually the interview process. So your interview with the selection committee, um, preparation and putting to drafting the briefing memo, and then your interview um, here in DC with the host offices that were interested in having you come on board for the year. Sure. Um, the interview process was very interesting because uh, it, it was great. I, I had there, it was very different from any medical school or residency interview I'd ever done because it really was again, uh, looking at how I would fit in in the realm of public policy or you know federal initiatives with the federal government. Um, so you had to kind of shift your mind set to 
not thinking about a particular specialty in healthcare, but rather thinking about how you fit into a broader context. And so that that was a great exercise, I think, to and prepared me well for this year. Um, I do think once you get to the interviews with your agencies, that is a much more specific focus. And I think those interviews really were for what that agency's mission was or the projects that they had in mind for me. Um, so those questions were geared towards that. Um, so for example, the NSF, you know, there were questions about, you know, what my interest in health technology was. And I did an interview with, uh, the, is it okay to talk about the interviews I did or, or no? Yeah, no, that's fine. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, with the FDA, it was a different focus, like what my thoughts were about um, some of the international uh, challenges with regulations. And with the CDC, it was also very different with uh, more of a population health angle. So uh, in that process, though, I think it was great because I read up on all of those agencies and really learned about what their priorities were and could always already shape how I would, you know, real, steer that conversation in terms of where I would fit into those uh, those goals. Great, thank you. Um, so I wanted to take a minute to remind everyone to please respond to our chat survey questions that are in the bottom left hand of your screen. Their, your feedback is really important to us and helps us plan future um, chat events. So another question that we received was from someone who said that they were a little bit more sort of senior in their career, and they were wondering what, val what value they would be able to bring um, to the government. And I know um, both Nia and Curie, both of you came into the fellowship experience with um, a few years of experience post um, your doctoral degrees or your MD degrees. So maybe could you speak a little bit about what you perceive to be the value of um, fellows who are a little bit more senior in their career and what they bring to the fellowship experience. Carrie, do you want to take that one first? Sure, because I'm the most senior. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, I think it depends on, on what you want to get out of it. This portion of my career, so I'm, I'm towards the end of what I, I think realistically is my clinical career, and um, it, you know, I wanted to do more. I wanted to have, be sort of more potent in the impact that I wanted to have. So for me, this is a perfect fit, as well as it allowed me, working for any novel areas, it allows me to network and, and collaborate with other people who have years and years of varied experience. I, so what I'm working on now is really interdisciplinary and, and cross-sectoral work with the biomedical sciences and social sciences. And so that took a lot of years to accumulate that knowledge, but it's very rare to have that kind of all contained in one person. So it's it's been very valuable for me to be here to expand on that, but I've also brought a lot of assets with me. And, and it's opened up doors and possibilities for me that I that I didn't really even know about before I got here. So I'm very, very excited about what the possibilities are moving forward. Great. Nita, is there anything you'd like to add? Sure. I would say that, um, you know, having been in clinical practice for seven years, uh, I still, you know, had a lot to offer in terms of the end user experience of technology. Um, I could advocate on the behalf of my patients and what works for them and what has been a challenge of integrating uh, technology into healthcare, but also be the voice of my colleagues in terms of how we use technology and what we need and uh, what can be done better. Um, so I think it wasn't just my knowledge base as a physician, but actually my experience from the end user of different technologies. Great. So we have a question that came in for both for both of you. And the questioner asks is, once you find a position within the policy fellowship program, are you assigned to a specific topic or area of focus, or are you expected to suggest how you will execute your own work? So Carrie, do you want to take that one first? Sure. So but when I interviewed in my office, I interviewed over the phone with Congressman Fortenberry, and he had very specific things that he wanted to do. He's very, very convicted about um, working on international development issues and wanted somebody with that background. And so they, they had certain areas they knew they wanted me to work on. When Ebola came around, and I had expertise in that area, and I was able to explain to the congressman how that is going to impact 
food and nutrition security and poverty in the Ebola affected countries, as well as what was happening with our domestic preparedness and response from a public health standpoint, he saw the import of that and said, it's important, we'll back you in the office, go ahead and do it. And then there's other issues that he, again, carries very much about wildlife conservation, especially around iconic species like elephants and rhinos, and very much had me working on that this year. And then other things that would come up, they, they kept things in my wheelhouse, so in the health and the welfare, social sciences, but as other things would come up that they just needed an ana analytical mind applied to and a little bit of research, I can support pretty much anything in the office. But I had very specific, a lot of them, but very specific issues that were of interest to the congressman. Great. Nita? Um, so sure, they, I was uh, recruited for the SPART and Connected Health Program, but as you all can imagine, technology and healthcare is quite broad. So within that, I was allowed to you know, choose and kind of develop my own interests and uh, my own uh, within that this program in at NSF, I was kind of able to craft what I wanted to work on, which was great. I was given a lot of flexibility in that, and it turned out that a lot of that was building collaborations and um, working on the, how our portfolio aligns with federal initiatives, thinking of new areas to focus on within healthcare, um, and thinking of. Uh, you know, new directions in terms of health and information technology. So I, I could, you know, essentially decide which of those spoke more to my interests and my long-term professional goals and work on those. So it wasn't rigid at all in terms of you must focus on this area because we want you to work on that. It wasn't that at all, which was wonderful. Great. So we have a question from Sarah who's asking, is it possible to get a AAAS Policy Fellowship Mentor to support me through the application cycle? So Sarah, we do, um, the, the, the six part chat series that we're hosting is a great way to learn more about how to draft a competitive application for the fellowship program. So I encourage you to view past chat sessions. We just held one in May and we'll be holding one, um, one each month through, the, through October. Um, in anticipation of the November 1st application deadline. If you also want to send an email to fellowships at AAAS.org, I'm happy to connect you with current and alumni fellows who can, who can speak to you and provide you with more sort of one-on-one -on -one, um, advice. Okay. So again, as a reminder, we have um, some survey questions at the bottom um, left hand of your screen. So if you could please take a moment to respond to some of those questions. And I think with that, we'll um, start wrapping up as our questions are coming to an end. But I wanted to um, end by asking both Nita and Curie if you could share some advice for, for people who are engaging in science policy. So the first question is to Curie. Um, Curie, what, what advice would you give to someone who is considering the fellowships? And what advice do you have generally for someone who, is, who might be considering a career path in science policy? So depending, you know, I can't speak to a lot of different areas because I'm not working in them, but what I, from, from the standpoint of what I've worked on, there's a huge need and there are a lot of opportunities. So the, the AAAS fellows, first of all, I didn't realize until I got here just how very well respected this fellowship is and how huge the network of fellows is um, that are still in the area and that will act as resources. So I think if, if you're even thinking about it, it, it's great to consider it. And the other thing to realize is you know, if you're doing a congressional fellowship, it's a year out of your life. It's an amazing experience. No, no matter what, you will come away having learned a lot, having made some great friends, and, and some incredible contacts. So I think for that reason, it's worth it. And I think, what was the other question about somehow pre preparing for it? Or what was the second half of that for, question? For, for just someone who's generally considering a career path in um, science policy, what advice would you have for them? Yeah, I think this is a, a fabulous place to start. I, you know, I had done work at the local, the state and local level through professional organizations. So if you haven't done that and you have the opportunity, I would certainly recommend getting involved with with those types of organizations. It's a good foothold for your understanding. But beyond that, this is where you learn that. You know, it's sort of an exchange. You provide good science advice, and they and learn about policy making. And in an in an environment where um, 
arguably some of the biggest decisions in science policy for the entire world are made in this town. And so if you can get here and spend a year, it, it can be pretty amazing. Great. And so Nita, I'm going to ask you the same question. So what parting advice do you have for scientists, engineers, and health professionals who are interested in engaging in science policy? How should they go about getting involved? So I think, I, I I'll first say I think one of the beauties of the fellowship is that you have this wonderful year in your life where somebody gives you the luxury of just learning again, you know, and after having been in clinical practice, it's, it, it is such a luxury. And I will say that just being a AAAS fellow, at, you get connected to so many other players with policy, not just federal government. And I think through the AAAS distribution of, of events happening in DC, I mean, there are so many policy-related think tanks that you know we don't often talk about, but also bring up fantastic opportunities to explore all the other exciting work that's happening in DC. So I think this, not only your fellowship placement, but also being within the network of other fellows and other happenings in the DC area is just phenomenally valuable in terms of getting exposure to all the different players that impact policy. Um, and I cannot recommend it highly enough. I, I really think that it's a fabulous way to spend a year of your life. Great, thank you. So and that brings us to the end of our time, and I want to thank both Curie and If we weren't able to get your questions today, please email us at fellowships at AAAF.org and plan to join us on July 30th for the next chat in the series where you'll be hearing from fellows with backgrounds in engineering, computer science, and math. You can find a full list of upcoming chats in this series and on-demand links for past chat sessions on our chat page. And as a reminder, the application deadline for the 2016-17 fellowship year is November 1st, and visit the fellowship's website for more information and details related to the application process. Thank you for joining us today. Have a wonderful afternoon. Can I say what? Oh, sorry. Can I say one thing? Yeah, I was just going to offer that if anybody wanted to reach out to us, I guess they can through you, but I would be happy to email back and forth or speak to anybody who wanted to talk in more detail about uh, our experiences, or my experience, I guess. I shouldn't speak for Gary. <laughs> I'd be happy to as appropriations allow. <laughs> okay, thank you all. So yes, if you wanted to reconnect with Carrie or Nina directly, if you please email fellowships at AAAF.org, and I'm happy to make that connection. Thank you for joining us today.